If you've seen our past cryptography videos, you've explored with us a few improvements on substitution ciphers. Throughout history, mathematicians, often in conjunctions with militaries, have been pushed to build better ways to build codes and break codes. But what happens when a mathematician with a knowledge of modular arithmetic and linear algebra gets involved in cryptography? In this video, we'll go over the fundamentals of modular mathematics and matrices that are needed to understand how the Hill cipher, which is not even 100 years old, operates, and how its structure can be seen in the encryption systems still in use today. Let's begin by building up our toolbox of mathematics. The first tool is modular arithmetic, a system of adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing numbers that wrap around in a cycle, indicated by a specific number called the modulus. Most people are more familiar with modular arithmetic than they realize. We use it every time we read a 12-hour clock. When you meet with your friends for a late morning brunch at 11 and end up staying way too long plotting your next innator, three hours later it's two when you leave. Elementary school addition should mean that 11 plus 3 equals 14, but 14 reads as 2 o'clock because the numbers wrap around every 12 hours. So we would say that 14 is congruent to 2 modulus 12. Written, 14 is congruent to 2 mod 12. Similarly, if someone works from noon to 8 p.m., then they think about doubling that work time, it has you working 16 hours, or until 4 a.m. 8 times 2 is congruent to 4 mod 12. Any number can be chosen as our modulus. For example, 13 would be congruent to 3 when working with modulus 10, 72 would be congruent to 22, mod 50, and 1 would be congruent to 3, mod 2. The next tool we'll be using is the structure of a matrix. A mathematical matrix, admittedly not as paradigm shifting as the matrix, is an array or table that can be filled with numbers, symbols, or expressions. The size, or dimensions, of a matrix are labeled by the number of rows and columns it contains, for example, this is a 2 by 3 matrix because it has 2 rows and 3 columns. Matrix addition and subtraction are done component-wise, meaning the top left entry is added to or subtracted from the top left entry in the other matrix, and so on for each corresponding entry. This means that in order to add or subtract matrices, they need to have the same dimensions or size. There are two ways to think about multiplication with a matrix. The most simple is called scalar multiplication and involves multiplying the entire matrix by a single number or scalar. If your scalar was 2, then the setup would look like this, and each entry of the matrix would be multiplied by two. There's also matrix multiplication, which is when two matrices are being multiplied. Unlike matrix addition, these matrices do not need to have the exact same dimensions to perform matrix multiplication, but the number of columns in the first matrix must be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix. If you have encountered matrix multiplication before, it probably seemed odd and maybe even nonsensical. Here is one example that naturally leads to the matrix multiplication algorithm. The example is based on costs and amounts. If hamburgers cost $4 each and you buy three burgers, it makes sense to multiply to find the total. But what if you have multiple items and multiple amounts of each item and you want to know the total amounts? That is where matrices can help. Matrices help organize the prices and the amounts. Suppose we have two different restaurants that price their food differently, like in the matrix here. There are also two teams that will buy different amounts of food. We want to know how much it will cost Team A to eat at Restaurant A, Team A at Restaurant B, Team B at Restaurant A, and Team B at Restaurant B. We need to do some type of multiplication since we have a cost matrix and an amount matrix and we want a total amount matrix. At first we might think to multiply corresponding entries. That does get us the right costs because we are multiplying costs of burgers by the number of burgers, cost of fries by the number of fries, etc. It also makes sense to add up the costs for each row so we get a total. When we do this, we have a total for Team A at Restaurant A and Team B at Restaurant B. But now, we see a problem. First, we won't get all possibilities of the total matrix on the right-hand side. And second, if we didn't have labels, we wouldn't know where to put them in the total matrix. The way the mathematicians have fixed both of these problems is to transpose one of the matrices. The first matrix, then, has the row labels for the total amount matrix. The second matrix, then, has the column labels for the total amount matrix. Now it's easier to keep track of all of the multiplications and sums we need to do for this problem. To find the cost for Team A at Restaurant A, we multiply the entries for Restaurant A with the entries of Team A, then add up all those values to get the particular total. We can do that same thing with the other combinations, Restaurant B with Team A, Restaurant A with Team B, Restaurant B with Team B. We know all of the combinations of rows and columns are needed, and we know where to put the total in the matrix on the right-hand side. 
This same process works for multiplying any two matrices. You can label the columns and the rows if it helps you to know the size of the final matrix and where each total value goes. This works as long as the length of the rows in the first match up with the length of the columns of the second. If they don't match up, then it means you're missing information, like the cost of shakes for each restaurant, or the number of shakes for each team, so it's impossible to calculate the total amounts. When your first matrix only has one row, we call it a row vector, and the result of the multiplication between the two, so long as the matrix you're multiplying by has as many rows as the vector has entries, will also be a row vector. To perform division on matrices, we need to adopt a multiply by the reciprocal understanding of division. With numbers, this would mean that rather than dividing by three, we're thinking about multiplying by one third. For matrices, rather than dividing matrix A by matrix B, we would multiply matrix A by the inverse of matrix B. In order to do this, we need to make sure matrix B is invertible. Just as we cannot divide a number by zero, one divided by zero is undefined, for example, we want to make sure finding the inverse of B isn't the matrix equivalent of dividing by zero. First, all invertible matrices need to be square, meaning they have the same number of rows as columns. The Hill cipher classically uses three by three matrices for the secret key. Then we can check the invertibility of a matrix by checking its determinant isn't zero. We won't take time to explain about the meaning of the determinant in this video, but keep an eye out for our future linear algebra videos. To check to see if a matrix is invertible or to find the determinant, you can use Wolfram Alpha. Great, now we have all the tools we need to use the Hill cipher. The Hill cipher is a block cipher, meaning that parts of the message are encrypted in blocks or chunks. This structure exists in many digital encryption schemes that we use today. The Hill cipher is most practically used in blocks containing three characters. So if our message is math overkill, we would start by encrypting MAT, then HOV, then ERK, and the last ILL. We put each of these blocks into a row vector, replacing the letters with numbers where A is zero, Z is 25. So MAT would become 12019, HOV 71421, ERK 41710, and ILL 81111. Now our encryption needs a secret key we can use to encrypt these blocks. To encrypt blocks of three characters, the cipher utilizes an invertible three by three matrix, where the determinant is not only non-zero, but cannot be two or 13 or any number with a factor of two or 13. Why? Well, it has to do with using 26 in our modular arithmetic, which is the number of letters in the alphabet. Mathematicians figured out that a matrix with a determinant with these factors will cause problems when decoding the message. There are infinitely many matrices that meet this requirement, but we'll use matrix K with entries 223, 135, 349 for our example. Checking that this matrix satisfies the requirements to be used as a key, we want to check first that it's a square matrix with dimensions that match the length of the blocks we're encrypting, check. Second, that it's invertible. We can check this by finding the determinant, and we see that the determinant is 11, which is indeed non-zero, so our matrix is invertible. Third, 11 does not have two or 13 as factors, so that condition is met. We can now use our secret key to encrypt our blocks. The encryption is done by multiplying the block or vector by the key matrix. This is where our modular tool comes into play. We don't have a letter associated with the number 81, but if we do our arithmetic mod 26, then we get that 81 is congruent to three, which is interpreted as the letter D. So MAT is encrypted to DWZ. Following this pattern with our next three blocks, we get an encrypted message of DWZ NKU DVF IPW. Part of what makes this cipher so strong is how much diffusion is present in the encryption method. One small change in the plain text or original message results in a large change in the cipher text or encrypted message. For example, if our plain text had been math over fill, just one letter different than the block that now contained ERF would encrypt to OBM. Making the cipher text DWZ NKU OBM IPW. So changing one character in our plain text resulted in a change of three characters in our ciphertext. That is diffusion. For our friend who we've given the secret key to, decrypting is very similar to encrypting, except they will use the inverse matrix of our key. The logic behind why this should return the plain text is as simple as multiplying by something, then dividing by that same thing, or multiplying by its inverse, should return us to what we started with. SageMath is an online math program and is particularly useful for doing these calculations as it works smoothly in modular arithmetic. Using this computation program, we can find the inverse matrix mod 26 to be 
this one, 3, 16, 19, 10, 15, 23, 9, 14, 24. Multiplying the vectors of our ciphertext by this matrix in mod 26 will return to us the original plain text vectors, which are M-A-T-H-O-V-E-R-K-I-L-L, -L, or math overkill. But like about every cipher, this cipher has weaknesses. It's especially vulnerable to a known plain text attack. If someone who didn't have the secret key managed to get their hands on even just a few characters of plain text and the corresponding ciphertext, then they could use those pairs, along with some matrix multiplication, to work out what the secret key matrix was. For a 3 by 3 key, a malicious person would only need 9 known characters to work out what the key had been, and thus be able to decrypt any message encrypted with that key. Here's a bit of a challenge. Can you figure out how matrix multiplication could be used to reverse engineer the secret key? Tell us your ideas in the comments. Let us know if you'd like to see a video that unpacks that process. Even though the Hill Cipher has weaknesses, the process of matrix multiplication plays important roles in more modern encryption methods, such as AES, because it provides diffusion, making it harder to break the code. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Be sure to follow Math the World on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for your support.